everybody. Um, what should I ask? Was that, was that supposed to ask you? Or? Do you want to ask me a question straight up? Why don't I explain the okay. form? Yeah, you're right. Um, I should say oh, yeah. that um, the art gallery very uh, kindly, uh, and I think was stretching the term celebrity a little bit when they asked me to come and uh, do this talk. <laughs> I, of course, readily agreed, um, sort of breaking my... I think the sort of first rule of running a theatre company is not to agree to do so many things. Anyway, I readily agreed and then realised, of course, that in the process of um, designing a show that I'm uh, uh, currently doing, The Seagull, and programming next year's season, and generally running a theatre company, um, I didn't, wasn't going to have a moment to really uh, write and think about half an hour's lecture that was going to be as sort of interesting and scintillating as it possibly should be. So we arrived at the idea of, of uh, inviting Simon along, who is... Uh, an extremely interesting person, uh, and that we would have <laughs> and some... And also stretching the notion of celebrity. <laughs> yeah, yeah. More of a celebrity than me. Um, <laughs> having appeared in numerous Australian films. Uh, and we would have some kind of a conversation that involved the two of us uh, and you. So I think maybe we should start... Um, maybe Simon might ask me a question, I might ask Simon a question, and then we might have one question from the audience, and then we might go around like that until we reach some point where we're all thoroughly bored, <laughs> or we reach half an hour, or both. <laughs> so, Simon. Um, um, why do you think the um, Art Gallery of New South Wales wanted two theatre makers to come and talk about the Archibald Prize? Good question. I think, I think, there's, I think there's a connection between um, painting and theatre. They're both kind of art forms that are um, that have been sort of pronounced dead, at least, if, they're not, if they are not in fact dead. I don't think they are, but they've both been sort of pronounced dead several times over the last century uh, because they've both been supplanted um, as primary means of communication of ideas by new technology and new modes of reproduction. So, uh, but nevertheless, we still do them, but they've become something um, that uh, exists alongside um, more, I suppose, efficient forms of communication, like film, photography, um, that are able to reach much greater audiences and, uh, and more cheaply, more easily, more efficiently, and in a more kind of um, economical way. To, to, to Maybe I'm going to ask you a question uh, in retaliation. Uh, um, can, I, can, can I add one thing to yeah. what you were saying? There's this great um, Milan Kundera novel called Slowness, which is not one of his most famous ones, but it was, um, it's one of his more recent ones where he, he argued in, I think it was the late 90s um, or early 2000s, that we've, we've lost the slowness that, that we used to be in love with uh, culturally. Uh, the fact that we now you know, fly in planes and, and, and uh, can reach places quicker and what you were talking about in terms of how quickly you can get a response from someone overseas or even share ideas with them quite fully, like sending them PDFs or films of things that you've been doing on the, the other side of the world. There is, the, there is an interesting idea in his novel that, 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 that perhaps we need to find moments in our lives where we can regain slowness. Um, and I think that, that that's kind of one of the attractions of the an analogue nature of... of, of Portraiture and and um, the visual arts in general, the all the, the analog visual art, the visual arts in general, and and theatre specifically, um, you, because they exist in a form of, of of old school slowness, in the same way that you kind of like to eat at organic restaurants, um, <laughs> uh, or you know eat food, you know at restaurants in, in, on the Italian coast that were part of the slow food movement or something. Do, do you think there's a do you think there's a kind of connection between... I mean, as a, as a theatre director, um, I should explain that Simon is one of these... is kind of uh, a renaissance... a sort of theatre renaissance man, both a, an actor, um, a director, and, and, and incidentally, an, an extremely fine playwright. Um, do you think, as a director, do you think there's some sort of correlation between the specific art of portraiture and and uh, which, which is what the Archibald is about and and being on stage absolutely I think that um there's I think uh, the, the first thing to say is that I think that um, there is 
a great degree of performance in portraiture. I mean, obviously, the kind of the um, aim. Uh, sometimes, sometimes it isn't. I, I can't speak for the aim of um, uh, various artists, but I, I have a feeling that either the subject or the uh, artist at times have an aim which is kind of performative, that, that is to represent an aspect of your personality that you think is, um, that is, revealing of, 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 is revealing of your identity, the way that you want to bring your, you know, present your identity to the world. Um, uh, so to, to sit to sit for a portrait is uh, is like um, and to choose someone to, to paint you or or to choose to be represented by somebody is and what you've got around you and, and the um, objects whether you're on a horse leading you know leading a horse into battle uh, and that, you're a general yeah, um, yeah, that's like being that's like the choices you make as as an actor and and and, and the composition and the way in which. Yeah, the, the artist chooses to represent that as a sort of analogy for being a director. A absolutely, because I think that there's a that, that that moment is kind of like, essentially, there's this moment where people do look at a great portrait and go, "I feel as if you got to something inherently essential in that person," and you uh, and I and I saw beyond the, the the form of representation into something far truer, and yet kind of essentially whatever choice that was that was made was an artificial one. It was, you know, to, to, to use uh, the play of light in a very specific way if it's a contextualised portrait, like... To put someone on a bicycle on a beach. To put by, someone yeah. on a bicycle or uh, 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 in the middle of, of a group of um, uh, meat carcasses hanging around them with a cleaver in your hand. Like, that, that says something about, that, about who you are as a person and that might not necessarily be who you are as a person at your darkest hours. Um, or at your most brilliant hours, and that choice is is an artificial choice. It's a snapshot of one moment in your life, and that creates a sense of identity. In the same way, we editorialise as theatre makers. We decide to portray characters at particular moments in their lives that we think are important dramaturgically for an evocation of a particular idea, like the moment before, like in The Wild Duck, which I, I just made. Um, uh, it is the week leading up, in, leading up to the suicide of, of the daughter of a family uh, and, and, and we, we do think that we're seeing the kind of person that these people, the kind of people that these people are um, but we're seeing them under in extremis, we're seeing a very very particular portrait of the kind of people they are under duress under the duress of, uh, of, of revelations and tragedy and, and, and awkward social interactions and, and that isn't necessarily a portrait of the mundanity of their lives or who they are 90% of the time. So it is artificial and true. And kind of iconic or kind of um, distilled or refined in some kind of way I suppose. Yeah. I wonder, a lot of great portraits... Isn't this time for the third oh, yeah. question from the... I was going to say something really brilliant. Oh, say something, something Now it's time brilliant. for a question. Uh, does anybody have a question to... In, or do you want to have questions at the end? Or do you want to have these interrupty questions? <laughs> We're extremely informal. <laughs> That's a good question. Quite, um, did you everyone hear that? Could could a performance be destroyed by getting the look of a character wrong? Um, yes, I think if um, if uh, we were talking about Death of a Salesman today, if Willie if Willie Loman looked like Elvis, it probably would be less empathetic a performance. That's actually quite a good idea. Um, uh, than than. No, they can't. That's that's and, and that's what casting is. That you, you come up upon a really interesting point that you know characters in a tragedy can't choose how they look. They are they are subject to their tragedy, and and that's why casting's really important because you don't want the person that you've put on stage who looks a particular way, who who, who behaves with a particular kind of personality, to feel. Uh, uh, so at odds with the personality of the of the written word that seems to kind of add together to you know, you know as a formula to create um, equals this kind of person um, uh, that that they're struggling inherently constantly against the notion of, of being that person. Um, how, how important is casting to making good theatre? 
um, incredibly. Right. I mean, there is that kind of truism that's kind of 99% of your job is casting and then the rest is just kind of telling people where to move. <laughs> um, uh, and, I, I, you know, like, I, I think that actually there's a lot, there is actually a lot of truth in that because someone who feels like they have everything in their life to say about the particular character's journey that they have to represent, um, who feels such a level of kind of association with the tribulations of their character or the joys of their character, um, will kind of be so spontaneous inventi and inventive that you as a director who has to try and associate with perhaps 15 characters in a play um, won't be able to be as insightful given, especially if you're 26 years old, white and middle class like I am, uh, uh, the chances are that you haven't experienced all the things that you, so your level of insight that you're going to be able to give will only be kind of craft based and not, not, not actually experience based. And this, is, this comes back to portraiture. Um, you, as, as an artist, you really, I, I, I think that the decision of who you want to paint there will be levels of, of association with that particular personality, with that person that you will inherently have or won't have. And I suppose the choice to paint someone who is very different from you is probably one that is made out of inherent curiosity. And the one, the choice to paint someone who is very much like you is, is a choice that's made um, out of, you know, ability to be kind of be able to let your own soul free in, 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 in the kind of the, the painting of that particular personality. Oh yeah, well, sorry. Sorry, we should microphone. Have said that great before, idea. Yeah. I, I was saying, if you're a professional portrait painter, then you don't always have the choice of who you'd like to paint because you need the commission. So, so some boring uh, mayor or something comes along and says, you know, they need a need a portrait. Then That's, you've just got to knuckle under. Do you think that the um, do you think that the ambassadors who who Holbein painted uh, in that? Do you know that fabulous paint? I think it's in the Nash. National Gallery in London of the two the two men standing side by side and there's this sort of great sort of collection of objects on the and there's a skull oh, there's a sort of long sort of distended skull but there's this sort of astrolabe and or there's a globe or something I, I they look like pretty ordinary guys <laughs> but there's something I, that's one of my favourite paintings and it sort of brings to, brings to this point of I don't know that the subject needs to be necessarily an interesting person for it to be a good or interesting painting. Yeah. And one of the curious things about, about when we come to the Archibald is I walk around and I go, it really does look like Ken Doan, you know. Oh, wow, that really looks like Richard Roxburgh. Oh, wow, that, that, um, uh, that looks like Hugo Weaving. Um, so I'm, I'm going and I'm, I'm, I'm sort of making an assessment of these paintings based on the ability of, of those artists to um, capture uh, a likeness of somebody who I know not personally, but through the media and through through other representations. But you but do know, like four of them, don't you? I know heaps of them. Yeah, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> we had falafel with one of them today. Yes, we um, did. <laughs> the um, the the great paintings from history, the great portraits from history, uh, that 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 are kind of that stop you in your tracks when you're walking through. Um, the art galleries of the world are not people who you have any idea what they really look like. We don't really know, I mean, I suppose they probably are photographs of Vincent van Gogh, but I don't think I've ever really seen one, or I, I, um, I'm not really interested in whether it's a good likeness or not. Um, uh, you know, this little painting uh, by Alma Tadema that I love that's in this gallery here, I don't really know what that, what that woman really looked like, and I don't really care. Um, so, so I, I I, I think there's a there's two there's sort of two separate games mm. going on, and I think it happens in theatre too. We we have um, sometimes a, a curiosity and, and a desire to come to theatre to see real people or people who we know or admire, mm. and sometimes we want to come and see kind of anonymous performers. I, I have a question in response to that. Yeah, um, that is, how much do you have to lie to tell the truth? Ooh. Because Kate doesn't look like Kate in that picture of Kate and her children. Like, is there a picture of Kate Blanchett? Yeah, there is, isn't there? Yeah, yeah. Oh, um, I, yeah. I, missed, I missed it. You missed it. Uh. Um, uh, and she doesn't look like Kate. And, and I think there's a conscious choice that is being made um, there. Um, uh, so how much, 
And, and as you're saying, you know, like, is there a greater truth to be found in, in, in the fact that someone might actually not look like... Is representation I think, the, the end yeah. of, of truthfulness? I think a good actor um, is somebody who exposes something in themselves that ordinary people would be unwilling to, to reveal. Something ugly, uh, something raw, something we would hide, ordinary people, mere mortals would hide. Um, and and it, to, to witness a great performance on stage is to see somebody opening night, you know, on that particular night, but in reality, night after night, something something of the, of the kind yeah. of viscera of themselves. Mm. And I think that when um, mm. To sort of obliquely answer your question, what a good painter can do is find a way of capturing that same kind of revelation of something deeply personal and interior um, in smudges of pigment mixed up in, in um, fat on a piece of woven cotton or linen, probably. Um, which is kind of amazing. It's incredibly removed. Mm. Yet we all relate to it and understand it and are moved by it or, or, or kind of see into the eyes of those people in those paintings and, 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 are, and, and feel something very human. It's pretty amazing. Like, I, 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 I can't believe I'm saying this, but I think that Ken Doan painting is really fantastic. I think it's really one of the best paintings down there. I think the one that won is actually the best painting down there. Yeah. Um, and Which is good. Yeah, it's good. Because it's the most virtuosic. It's the one that captures something extraordinary about that person with what looks like my toast uh, in the morning. Um, yeah. You know, there's a few smears of jam and there, there's this sort of... Um, uh, or sort of bratwurst. But there's, um, <laughs> it's a toast in the morning and the evening. <laughs> yeah, evening toast. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think the Ken Doan painting is, is amazing because it captures yeah. something, it really looks like him. Yeah. And it reveals something about himself. Yeah. Which I wouldn't have expected from, from walking past his shop in the, in, in the rocks or, or the kind of common associations with him as an artist. I, I have a question, another question. I know this is breaking the form because it's yeah, your no, turn I, to I, ask I think question. I owe you a question, but go on. Yeah. Um, uh, and this is, I suppose, kind of to all of us. Um, um, one of the things that unites... Um, uh, painting and theatre is the fact that it always looks shit when you try and put it in a digital representation. Like, paintings don't look good in newspapers, they don't look good on the internet, they don't look in any way like the experience of, watch, of being in the same room as them, and theatre really doesn't look good when you film it. It's terrible. Um, what that's, that's is, what is it about presence in these art forms, about being in the same room as them, that, that makes them unrepeatable um, and therefore not very good at being um, um, part of the capitalist system because they can't be proliferated endlessly. Yeah. Um, as somebody who goes to the theatre all the time, I sometimes wonder why um, it requires so much energy. I mean, to, be, to really to sit in an audience should be a pretty easy job. And it's kind of my job a lot of the time, but it's actually not. It actually, it's not like going to the cinema. It's, it's, and I think it's because it's actually quite an active thing. To sit in an audience is, is to be the other half of a kind of performance that's taking place in the space of a theatre. One half is the performers on the stage, and the other half is you. And we're actually all just, if you looked at it like aliens or some people from a vastly different culture, it would be very hard to discern which ones which way it was going, yeah. which ones are performing and which ones are, which ones are watching. Are, are those people on the stage responding to all those people laughing? And or why are the costumes in the audience bank weirder <laughs> than the ones on stage? <laughs> yeah, what, that's right. Um, the, um, so I, I, I think it's, a, it's, it's about that thing, it's about the sort of physical presence of the people uh, in, the same, in the same room, obviously. It's a mm. sort of obvious thing to say that makes that untransferable and, 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 and it's nothing as excruciating as watching theatre on film. You just have to watch when ABC News come and do um, a little snippet of, of one of the shows we're working on. You kind of watch it on the, on the news and you just go, wow, that looks like the worst show I've ever seen in I, my life. I actually got uh, worried once when one of my shows looked good on the ABC News. <laughs> I went, 
oh, I've done something wrong. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and that's because to perform for a camera and to perform for a room full of people, who some of whom are um, a long way away from you, is a completely different craft. Mm. The object... I think there's a sort of amazing thing with a painting. I, I'm... It's a, it's a thing, you know? It's this... It's like it's this thing that's made of stuff. Old paintings are amazing. I'm looking into this room full of 19th century paintings there. They've, you know, that Rupert Bunny painting has not had an elbow being put through it. It hasn't been burnt in a fire. Uh, it hasn't been lost or... It, 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 it exists as an object only in that it's a collection of, of bits of stuff that are assembled in such a way to represent those um, particular people. I hope that is a Rupert Bunny painting. Um, the... Uh, and the, the interesting thing with sort of celebrity, if we're going to talk about that, is that um, I think according to the rules of the Archibald, I don't know how strictly anyone really adheres to this, but theoretically that object has been in the presence of the person who it represents and the person who created it at the same time. And those two people then left each other's presence and this thing is left as a kind of love child of, of, of the meeting of, of those two things. So it sort of becomes quite sort of precious. Uh, and in this sort of a, in this sort of age where um, you can look at anything at any time on on the internet, you kind of can't really. You can look at a painting, but a painting of a picture of this is just going to look, you know, like the SBS test pattern. Um, <laughs> but it's a. I think it's. A, I, I don't even know who painted it. It's a brilliant painting um, because it kind of has this physical luminosity and this kind of glowing, uh, surprising brilliance about it. Um, and if people the, get bored by us, they can a get lots of people are looking at it now. The, yeah. Um, now I'm going to ask you a question, but I don't have one, so let's get one from the... Oh, there's the, oh yes. So it would be great. We love the intimacy of the yeah. I don't think it's on. Is that on? No. Theatre, and the intimacy to us is sitting in the front row, being a few feet away from the actor. I always wonder why people go to the theatre and sit way up the back do they get the same feeling? You know, I think that's a really good point. Um, go to the op if you go to the opera and sit in the front row, it's the best show you've ever seen in your life. And, um, but you also see the level of mugging that's going that's, on. That's why it's so good. <laughs> it's exactly why it's so good. I went and saw Lulu, you know that Berg, yeah, strange Berg, Berg opera. Yeah. And um, the girl was sort of there dying and, and, you know, there was a bit of scenery moving around and there was a few people sort of standing around in the background of the wings so you could see and then she got this tube of blood out that said fake blood on it, no <laughs> kidding, out of her pocket and was squirted, squirted all over herself and then she sang an aria like this. I was like, this is brilliant. But then I was talking to my friend who was further back and she, she, he was like, oh, that bit where she died, that was so boring because he missed all the good bits, which was, which was, which was all the tricks. The mechanics, yeah. The mechanics of it. Um, yeah, look, I, I, love, I, I think it's a, a lot easier to have a good time in the front row. The trick of being a good theatre director, uh, and you, they make you do this in opera. When, when I was just working on, a, on an opera in Texas, um, they put the seats for us to, to compose the show 25 rows back. Uh, so you have to make the show from there because they want you to know that it works for everybody in the house. And then when I actually saw the opera on opening night and I was sitting in the fifth row, I thought, God, this is not too bad, actually. Um, You've got to make it for the worst seats in the house. Yeah, and I, I, I think there are some magic theatres in terms of architecture and some magic performers that are as scintillating up front as they are at, all the way at the back. Um, there's a wide shot, to use a cinematic phrase, and I do kind of resent the idea that I'm about to use a cinematic phrase about theatre, but um, uh, there is a wide shot that you get which is kind of contextual um, that is probably more image based that is about the physicality of two people where you can get the subtlety of the interrelation of two people like, like a juck you know to use an artistic um, uh, a, 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 like a metaphor from the, an analogy from the arts um, a Giacometti, some of those um, sculptures where there are multiple figures on on a plane where the ability to kind of see the context between as opposed to those which are just single figures um, there's you know, but yeah, that's, that's what theatre is. In the front row, it's one of Giacometti's single figures, sculptures, and, and in the back row, it's one of, one of his plain um, figures where there are like three or four people um, walking across a plane or standing around each other, and, and, um, and, 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 and both of those are equally valuable, I think. So, and, and 
and that's not to make it more filmic by being in the back row because the event is essentially not being, you know, cinema is not necessarily having more perspective or being further away or being more distant. It's, um, it's not knowing that, you know, it's, it's not being able to know that the moment is happening in the same room as you. And that's, that's the kind of ritualistic um, delight of, of theatre is this is happening with me and it's, I'm part of it and it's part of me. We don't do much of that anymore. Like, um, I'm not a... I don't, I don't go to church. Uh, hopefully don't have to go to court very much. <laughs> Uh, we don't, don't go have, to mass hangings. Yeah, we don't have many. Collect, we don't do bear baiting. No. Um, I don't really ever go to to see sporting events. Although I think that's probably the exception that still exists within our culture. And a problem with you. Yes, I I ought to. Um, <laughs> we we don't do much stuff collectively and together anymore. That we and theatre is one of those little remnants um, of of a time when when we when we had to. That I think is a really beautiful thing. Mm. We, I think we've got time for one more question. Yes. There's a, there's a painting downstairs uh, which is a sort of imitation of Caravaggio. Mm. Remember yeah. the, the beheading the, one? Ju- ju- yeah. I, well. I often wonder why people choose to rewrite the past in this way, in the way that you, uh, some people might want to rewrite Ibsen, who knows, <laughs> uh, when uh, Ibsen possibly did it better. Um, uh, I'd, I'd just be interested yeah. to know. I, Ibsen did do it better, um, uh, and, and, so, and so did Caravaggio. Um, uh, the difference, essentially, I think, between... If, if you're suggesting... If you're trying to ask me to talk about The Wild Duck um, uh, uh, and that painting downstairs, is that, that that painting uses the same form as the original. Um, it, uh, uh, whereas... Mm, kind of the composition is the same. It, it, the recognition relies upon the same form being employed. Um, the Wild Duck, essentially, the difference between the two was that it was a completely different form of play. It was a t- completely different experience in the theatre. If I were to be trying to rewrite Ibsen uh, using a four-act structure uh, and and people speaking it, and, and it being set in the 19th Century uh, in um, Nor- in a small town in Norway. I'm, I'm certainly it certainly would be incredibly presumptuous of me to assume that I'd be able to do it better than Ibsen. Um, but, that being- but 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 I live in this this century in this year in this place in Sydney, and I know that better than Ibsen does because he doesn't and he's dead. Um, and uh, and so I you know the mo- me representing human life right now. Uh, I, I, I do have the upper hand over Ibsen. <laughs> he, um, there was a really quite wonderful director who I won't name who came to, dropped into our office very briefly the other day to talk about an idea of doing a Shakespeare play next year and <laughs> it's not, it wasn't a very well known Shakespeare play and I said surely there's a reason why everybody always does Hamlet and nobody ever does King John. And he said, well, there is because the, the central character is, is, isn't very likeable, which is a really good answer. And he's not really a villain and he's not really a hero. He's just, he's just kind of mixed up. Really great answer to that question. Why, if King John is such a great player, as you're telling me, why doesn't everybody do it? Um, and I said I only asked that question because sometimes you discover that, that um, hidden classics are hidden for a reason. Um, and... <laughs> He said, well, it's funny that, you know, I, he was doing a production on the West... You're probably going to be able to infer who this was from this story, but anyway. Um, he was doing a production on the West End in, 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 in London of The Taming of the Shrew, and he realised that there's something, funny, something fundamentally wrong with The Taming of the Shrew. There's lots of things wrong with The Taming of the Shrew, in my opinion, but there is... He realised that structurally there was something fundamentally wrong with The Taming of the Shrew, and that Shakespeare had somehow forgotten to um, really exp- explain uh, the fundamental sort of uh, problem of the play. So he wrote a speech... Uh, for in uh, iambic, in, in pentam- a, in iambic pentameter um, <laughs> for one of the characters to explain exactly what's going on and inserted it two and a half pages none of the actors and none of the audience and none of the critics noticed <laughs> that he had added two and a half pages of mock Elizabethan uh, <laughs> writing in, into the play so it's amazing what liberties you can take and, it's, it, and I think it's not always necessarily 
Shakespeare wasn't perfect. He was certainly an absolute genius. Uh, but um, his plays are full of holes. And, and so I don't know that we should treat them with too much reverence um, is also a kind of answer to that question. I think it's 7 o'clock and you've got to see a film. Is that right? Oh, 7.30 for your film. We could talk for hours. Um, <laughs> is it time to wind up? Thanks for listening to us ramble on and thanks for the excellent questions. And if you want to come and see some really immediate theatre where every seat in the house is a great seat, come to Belvoir Street. That's right. <laughs> <laughs>